Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your explorer today. On um, August 17th, 1999, at 3.01 a.m., my bed began to shudder, then move across the marble floor of my bedroom toward the windows. My apartment was snuggled among a complex of old stone buildings on a steep hill rolling down across a usually busy thoroughfare and into a busy international waterway. As artworks on the wall and Euro top items went askew and toppled, I leapt from my bed, totally disoriented, to look out the large sliding glass windows to see I knew not what I would see, but at least wondering if my three flat 200 year old building were the only building rocking and rolling. For a better view, I cautiously moved up the marble staircase to the upper street level floor and to the larger and higher living room windows as the movement of the building continued for what proved in the end to be only 37 seconds but surely an eternity as i slid the tall windows open to the nighttime breeze off the water i peered across the big ancient city with landmarks and places of worship always dramatically lit throughout the night. Thousands of lights across the massive historic city. In one shocking moment that I shall never forget, all the lights went out and all the stars shone brightly above a now roughly tumbling waterway. A single moment for me when time seemed to stand still. And in that single moment, I was struck with an awe that could match no other in my life. August 17, 1999, 3.01 in the night, 37 seconds, one set of lights across a wide expanse of major city went out, and another set of lights high above it went on. A gasp rumbling through my whole body. It was the famous East meets, East meets West city of Istanbul, Turkey. It was a catastrophic 7.6 magnitude earthquake at a shallow depth of 9.3 miles below the surface centered in the village of Izmit, 64 miles from my Giangir neighborhood perch. In the end, the 37 second earthquake killed 18,000 sleeping Turkish men, women, and children, along with foreign expatriates and tourists. My building, at least most, like most old stone buildings in Istanbul, suffered only minimal damage, but the increased destruction 
seen on each additional mile closer to Ismet was breathtaking for all the wrong reasons. That 37 seconds was never to be erased from my memory and may it remain. And that moment of lights out, stars on, was the single most awesome moment of my life. Today's book in the spotlight is all about the, quote, new science of everyday wonder and how it can transform your life. A recent January 2023 article in the New York Times begins with this paragraph, quoting, awe can mean many things. It can be witnessing a total solar eclipse, or seeing your child take her first steps, or hearing Lizzo perform live. But while many of us know it when we feel it, awe is not easy to define. The book is simply called Awe. And the author is renowned Mexican-born American expert in the science of human emotion, Dr. Dachar Keltner. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Dachar Keltner. From the arms of two early members of the counterculture of the 1960s came Dachar Joseph Keltner in Jalesco, Mexico, 1962. His mother, a literature professor, and father, an artist, moved back to California in the late years of the decade and raised both him and his brother in Laurel Canyon, northwest of Los Angeles before a move to a conservative town in the foothills of the California Sierra Nevada. Keltner received his Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology and sociology from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1984. Five years later, he received his PhD from Stanford University, then completed three years of postdoctoral at the University of California, San Francisco. Keltner began his academic career at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then returned to the University of California in Berkeley's psychology department in 1996, attaining full professorship in 2002. Dr. Keltner's research focuses on the biological and evolutionary origins of compassion, love, awe, beauty, and power, social class, and social inequality. Kelder has published over 190 scientific articles, writing for the New York Times Magazine, the New York Times, the London Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, and Utna Reader. He has received numerous national prizes and grants for his research. On the American massive open online course provider called edX, E-D-X, created by Harvard and MIT, Keltner's online course on, quote, the science of happiness has enrolled over 300,000 students. In his best-selling book, Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life, 
Keltner explores the science behind well-being. The book attempts to counter the bias that we are wired to be self-interested. He explores the Confucian idea of the gen ratio, the relationship between actions that bring the good of others to completion and those that bring out bad. The greater score is a direct relation to your happiness. In the book, he touches on the qualities of gratitude, compassion, play, awe, embarrassment, teasing, and how these qualities are innate in people, but also can be developed. In his new 2023 published book, Awe, Dr. Keltner writes about awe is critical to our well-being, says he, just like joy, contentment, and love. His research suggests it has tremendous health benefits that include calming down our nervous system and triggering the release of oxytocin, the love hormone that promotes trust and bonding. Dr. Keltner and his family live in Berkeley, California, where he is a professor of psychology and the faculty director of the university's Greater Good Science Center. The book, Awe, with the subtitle, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. As the book jacket entices, Awe is mysterious. How do we begin to qualify the goosebumps we feel when we see the Grand Canyon or the utter amazement when we watch a child walk for the first time? How do you put into words the collective effervescence of standing in a crowd and singing in unison? or the wonder you feel while gazing at centuries-old works of art. Up until 15 years ago, there was no science of awe, the feeling we experience when we encounter vast mysteries that transcend our understanding of the world. Scientists were studying emotions like fear and disgust, emotions that seemed essential to human survival. Revolutionary thinking, though, has brought into focus how, through the span of evolution, we've met our most basic needs socially. We survived thanks to our capacities to cooperate, form communities, create culture, that strengthens our sense of shared identity. Actions that are sparked and spurred by all. In the book, Dacher Hel Keltner presents a radical investigation and deeply personal inquiry into this elusive emotion, revealing his research into how all transforms our brains and our bodies. Alongside an examination of awe across history, culture, and within his own life during a period of grief, Keltner shows us how cultivating awe in our everyday life leads us to appreciate what is most humane in our humane nature. Well, in my humble opinion, and do forgive the play on words, but awe is striking. It is such a superb analysis of an emotion that is, is strongly felt 
but poorly understood. And it includes a showcase of examples that remind us of what is worthy of all. New York Times bestselling author of Stumbling on Happiness and host of the PBS television series, This Emotional Life, Daniel Gilbert writes about awe as, quote, an engaging and insightful exploration of the ordinary magic that connects us to the world, to each other, and to the meanings of our lives. The science of wow has finally arrived. A great quote. And I couldn't agree more. Surely, during a moment in which our world feels more divided than ever before, and more imperiled by crises of different kinds, we are greatly in need of all. All. Bring it on. So, Taka Kepner, tell us about all from your scientific viewpoint. I'm going to attempt to read three small sections. One is his introduction, which I think brilliantly sets the stage um, and, and combines both a, um, a normal conversational style with some scientific tidbits and tones thrown in on the side. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to his small section on defining all, which is quite intriguing. Actually. And then I'd like to give a couple of examples, as I mentioned earlier, this method with examples from people which he's collected over time um, uh, of the, the wonders of others is the name of the section. So let's see if we can cover all that. <laughs> so the introduction, see how he introduces this subject. He writes, <clears throat> I have taught happiness to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. It is not obvious why I ended up doing this work. I've been a pretty wound up anxious person for significant chunks of my life and was thrown out of my first meditation class for laughing while I chanted, I am a being of purple fire. Life can surprise us though, in giving us the work we are here to do. So, Nearly every day in classrooms of different kinds, from kindergarten circle rugs to lecture halls in Berkeley, from the apses of churches to inside prisons, from sterile conference rooms to hospitals to gatherings in nature, I have taught people about finding the good life. What are we seeking in such inquiries as an answer to a, a perennial question? One we have been asking in different ways for tens of thousands of years. How can we live the good life? One enlivened by joy and community and meaning that brings us a sense of worth and belonging and strengthens the people and natural environment around us now, 20 years into teaching happiness, I have an answer. Find awe. Awe is the emotion we experience when we encounter vast mysteries that we don't understand. Why would I recommend that you find happiness in an emotion that is so fleeting and effervescent, a feeling so elusive that it resists simple description, that requires the unexpected and moves us toward mystery and the unknown rather than what is certain and easy. Because we can find all everywhere. Because doing so doesn't require money or the burning of fossil fuels or even much time. Our research suggests that just a couple of minutes a day will do. 
Because we have a basic need for awe wired into our brains and bodies, finding awe is easy if we just take a moment and wonder. Because all of us, no matter what our background, can find our own meaningful path to awe. Because brief moments of awe are as good for our mind and body as anything you might do. My hope for you in reading this book is simple. It is that you will find awe. In the service of this aim, I will need to tell you four stories. The first is the new science of all. In ways I am beginning to understand, I was raised to study all with the tools of science. My mom taught poetry and literature at a large public university. And in how she lived her life, she taught me about the wisdom of the passions and to speak truth in power. My dad painted in the horrifying and beautiful style of Francisco Goya and Francis Bacon and suggested that life is about seeing the Tao with your Zen mind, beginner's mind. I grew up in wild Laurel Canyon, California in the late 1960s with the Doors and Joni Mitchell as neighbors. And then in the hard scrabble foothills of the Sierras where a poor rural wilderness prevailed. The soaring ideas of the time, civil rights, anti-war protests, women's rights, sexual and artistic revolution, Watergate, filled the conversations at our dinner table and posters on the walls of our home. I spent unusual amounts of time as a child looking at art and hearing about great scenes and characters in novels, poems, paintings, and films. But I showed no early talents, to my chagrin, for literary analysis or writing fiction, nor for painting or drawing, for that matter. Instead, I was awestruck by dinosaurs, natural history museums, sports statistics, basketball, the Beatles, the biological life of ponds and creeks, and being near mountains, rivers, and wide open star-filled skies. Given the passion-filled home and the passionate era I was raised in, I guess it makes sense that I would devote my career to mapping emotions with science. First at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then at University of California, Berkeley. Early in my career, I spent hundreds of hours in a basement lab discerning in frame-by-frame -frame video analysis the expressions of embarrassment and shame, fitting for the paranoid young professional that I was. With the arrival of two daughters and the delights of family life filling my days, I would turn to the wonders of laughter. How we express love in the face of body, and face, the vocalizations and physiological patterns of compassion, and how, with simple acts of touch, we could express gratitude. This work was animated by the thesis that emotions like compassion, gratitude, and love are the glue of social relations, which I summarized in my book, Born to be Good, the science of a meaningful life. What about awe, though? Is awe a fundamental emotion, a universal core to who we are, like fear, anger, or joy? How would one study awe scientifically? Measure feelings that seem beyond words? Could we bring all so mysterious and how it rises reliably into the lab? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, my PhD students and I, as well as other scientists around the world, began to find all in the lab. We charted this elusive emotion with new measures of the brain and body, physical responses like tears, and the contraction of small muscles 
surrounding hair follicles. Sensations like the chills and demonstrations of how awe transforms the way we think and act. We have studied how we feel awe near great trees and looking out at panoramic views. At sporting events, pump rock shows and in the fl flowing of effervescence of dance. In mystical experiences in prayer, motivation, yoga, and during psychedelic trips. In peak experiences with music, visual art, poetry, fiction, and drama, science found all producing the first story of all I will tell. Before science, humans were making sense of awe in forms of culture. The second story we will hear then is how cultural archives all. This is a story of how we create music, visual art, religion, fiction, and film to share in experiences of all so that we may understand the vast mysteries we face together in a culture we call our own. Awe animates the stories, ceremonies, rituals, and visual designs of indigenous peoples dating back tens of thousands of years. You might think of those um, as our first awe technologies. Awe structures the legends, myths, temples, and sacred texts of religion. It jumps out of paintings, photographs, and films from Goya to Berlin street side artist to the films of Miyazaki. And you can sense it in your body and feel its form in nearly every kind of music from the sounds of the Kora of West Africa to an Indian raga to Nicki Minaj. Science tends toward generalization. Cultural forms aspire to idealization and often some perfection of form. There is a third story of awe we need to hear, the personal and first person. This became clear to me when I asked people this question and listened to the stories they told. What is an experience of awe that you have had when you encountered a vast majority mystery that transcends your understanding of the world? Mystery. If you have a spare moment, you might think of an awe story of your own. The stories I heard people tell reveal timeless truths about awe. About the awe of watching a quadriplegic person a former Olympic athlete, take his first steps while recovering from a devastating injury to his spine, of being in the front row of a Coltrane concert when he was just breaking big, or from a woman in the CIA at Aru Grari who discovered her passivism in looking at the currents of the Euphrates River. Moved by these narratives, I gathered personal stories of all from doctors, combat veterans, professional athletes, prisoners, writers, environmentalists, poets, musicians, artists, photographers, filmmakers, ministers, indigenous scholars, spiritual pilgrims, midwives, and hospice workers. Stories about the courage of people who suffer with disease and how nature transforms the traumas of combat. Of how music allows us to find home in a strange land. About what it is like to nearly die and how we make sense of such extraordinary experiences. These personal stories revealed first person truths in a particularly metaphor, image, and vernacular that science simply cannot capture, and that cultural forms only approximate. These three stories of all, the scientific, the cultural, and the personal, converge on an understanding of how we can find all. Where do we find it? 
in response to what I will call the eight wonders of life, which include the strength, courage, and kindness of others, collective movement in actions like dance and sports, nature, music, art and visual design, mystical encounters, encountering life and death, and big ideas or epiphanies. These wonders are all around us. If we only pause for a moment and open our minds, there are so many opportunities for every day all. How does all transform us? <clears throat> By quieting the nagging, self-critical, overbearing, status-conscious voice of ourself or ego, and empowering us to collaborate, to open our minds to wonders and to see the deep patterns of life. Why all? Because in our distal evolution as very social mammals, those individuals who united with others in all like patterns of behavior fared well in encounters with threats and the unknown. And because of the more proximal calculus of thriving in the present, all brings us joy, meaning, and community along with healthier bodies and more creative minds. There is one last story of awe that led me to write this book, one I had no interest in being a part of. That story began on a blustery January day in 2019. On that day, I stepped off a handball court, sweaty and unburdened, Having finished a tough game with my longtime partner, Isaac, I looked at my iPhone on my gym bag, two texts. From my brother's wife, Kim, can you come here as fast as possible? 15 minutes later, from my mom, it's over. Rolf took the cocktail. He is leaving us. Rolf is my younger brother, born a year after me in a small clinic in Jalesco, Mexico. The cocktail was the combination of end-of-life opiates he took, which usually ends a human life in an hour or two. I called Kim, who summarized. It was a bright morning with a blue sky. Rolf and Lucy, their 14-year-old daughter, sat outside and had a long talk the sun. Rolf came in and said he was ready. He took it at 3 p.m. He wandered around the kitchen, checked the fridge, rambled. I told him it was time to lie down. So we lie down in his bed. After a while, he fell asleep. He's snoring. Here, listen. Kim put the phone up to Rolf's mouth. I heard the deep, rhythmic vibration of his vocal cords. His death rattled. My parents are here. Your dad and Nancy are on their way. Can you bring your mom? We'll get there as soon as we can, I replied. Thank you, Kim. I picked up my wife, Wally, and our daughters, Natalie and Serafina, in Berkeley, then my mom in Sacramento. We arrived at Rolf and Kim's house in the foothills of the Sierras at 10 p.m. Rolf, Rolf was lying in a bed downstairs, which he had retreated to in his last weeks. He lay on his stomach and right cheek, his head tilted slightly upward. My dad held his foot. I leaned in near his midsection. My mom was at the head of the bed, stroking his thin air. Rolf's face was full and flushed. The sunken eyes and gaunt cheeks caused by colon cancer were gone. 
The tightened, sagging skin around his mouth smoothed. His lips curled upward at the corners. I rested my right hand on his left shoulder, a rounded protrusion of bone. I held it that way. I would the smooth granite stones we used to find near the rivers we swam in as young children. Rolf, this is dark. You are the best brother in the world. My daughter Natalie laid her hand lightly on his shoulder blades. We love you, Rob. The cycle of his breathing slurred. Who's listening? Aware. Listening to Rolf's breath, I sensed the vast expanse of 55 years of our brotherhood. Roaming Laurel Canyon in the late 60s, spying on rock and roll neighbors and skateboarding through Volkswagen line streets. In our adolescence, walking the wild foothills of the Sierras and playing Little League on the Penryn A's, me pitching, Rolf, a long haired lefty on first, a mischievous light in his eyes saying, Man, this is fun. As young adults on wild trips to Mexico, dancing in clubs, wandering in the high Sierras. And then in graduate school, buying wedding suits, and being each other's best man, becoming teachers and fathers to daughters. I sensed a light radiating from Rolf's face. It pulsated in concentric circles, spreading outward touching us as we leaned in with slightly bowed heads. The chatter in my mind, clasping words about the stages of colon cancer, new treatments, lymph nodes, and survival rates faded. I could sense a force around his body pulling him away and questions in my mind. What is Rolf thinking? What is he feeling? What does it mean for him to die? A voice in my own mind said, I feel awe. My feeling in that overwhelming moment shared some essence with experiences of awe from my past, both big, for example, seeing Nelson Mandela speak about his 27 years of captivity with 50,000 other people. And small, seeing the dusk light on an oak tree, listening to my young daughter's duets of laughter. Watching Rolf pass, I felt small, quiet, humble, pure, the boundaries that separated me from the outside world faded. I felt surrounded by something vast and warm. My mind was open, curious, aware, wandering. A couple of weeks after Rolf's passing, Kim brought together friends and family to tell our stories of Rolf. We talked about his fascination with clowns, magic tricks, Oh, he loved to cook for crowds of friends and enthrall neighborhood kids with his over-the-top Halloween costumes. From his co-workers came stories of how he calmed the most difficult boys at a little mountain school where they taught. And then the stories tapered off and we fell into silence. A church bell rang, stirring a spiral of blackbirds out of the trees rising into a sky heavy with dark gray clouds. We shook hands and hugged and then walked quietly out of Rolf and Kim's home to return to our lives, mine with a Rolf-sized hole in it. In the grief that followed, I would regularly jolt awake before dawn, gasping. My body ran hot, I ached physically. I dreamed dreams unlike anything I'd experienced before. In one, I was walking up a dark winding dirt road to an illuminated Victorian 
that resembled our childhood home in Penryn. Rolf burst around a corner in yellow shorts running in his high school mile of strides. He stopped, waved, smiled, and moved his lips, uttering words he knew I could no longer hear. I experienced the hallucinations that Joan Didion describes in the year of magical thinking. I saw the outline of Rolf's face in the shifting boundaries of neighboring clouds. On one walk on the Berkeley Pal Ca campus, I saw his chemo-enhanced eyes in the spiraling bark of a redwood tree. I heard his voice in the rustling of leaves, his sigh in the wind. On two occasions, I was so convinced I had seen him that I followed strangers whose shoulders, foreheads, freckles, and jaw lines looked like his. Our minds are relational. We see life patterns through our shared experiences with others, sense life's its significant themes in the sounds of others' voices, and feel embraced in things larger than the self through others' touch. I saw the wonders of the world through Rolf's eyes. With his passing, I felt aweless, and my companion in awe was no longer around to help me make sense of the vast mystery I had encountered in my 57 years of living. The loud voice called out, find awe. Knowing of awe's many benefits and that we can find it all around us, I went in search of awe. I took a moment each day to be open to the awe-inspiring world around me. I sought out places of importance in the history of awe. I engaged in open-ended conversations with people I consider awe pioneers. I immersed myself as a newcomer in various wonders of life. These explorations led to personal experiences, memories, dreams, and insights that helped me make sense of losing my brother. They brought me to the conviction that awe is almost nearby and is a pathway to healing and growing in the face of the losses and traumas that are part of life. There are four stories of awe then for us to consider together, the scientific, the personal, the cultural, and one about the growth that all can bring us when we face hardship, uncertainty, loss, and the unknown. I have organized this book accordingly. The first three chapters traverse the scientific story of awe. We consider what awe is, the contexts in which it arises, how it differs from awe and beauty, from fear and beauty major correction there, and how it feels in our everyday lives, chapter one. We follow how awe transforms our sense of self, our thought, and our relation to the world, chapter two. And we take an evolutionary journey back in time to ask, why awe? Jane Goodall, a hero of mine, believed that chimpanzees feel awe and have a sense of spirituality grounded in a capacity Goodall describes as, quote, being amazed at things outside of yourself. Animated by this mystery, we will investigate where our chills, tears, wide open eyes and mouths and wows and woes come from in our mammalian evolution and what this tells us about the primordial meaning of all. Chapter five. In the second section of the book, we turn to personal stories of awe. We will hear stories about the transcendent power of others' moral beauty and its place in prisons and more life-enhancing institutions like libraries and hospitals. About finding collective effervescence in ecstatic dance and professional basketball in the collective movement of our daily lives, 
about nature and how it can help heal the traumas of combat, loneliness, and poverty. Chapter six. The third section shifts to a treatment of how culture achieves awe in different forms. We will consider the place of awe in music. Chapter seven. Visual art, chapter eight, and religion and spirituality, chapter nine. These are large tasks indeed, but illuminating once we narrow in on the place of awe in these creative forms of culture. The last section of the book returns to how awe helps us grow when we face loss and trauma, and more generally when we face the unknowns and uncertainties of life. It was striking for me to learn how central awe is and how we grapple with life and death and their ever repeating species shaping cycle. Chapter 10. And how across the eight wonders of life, awe reveals big insights to us about the point of our lives in our continual search for meaning. Chapter 11. In teaching happiness for more than 20 years, I have seen how much health and well-being we gain and being amazed at things outside our lives. Outside our lives. By finding awe, from our first breath to our last, awe moves us to deepen our relations with the wonders of life, and to marvel at the vast mysteries that are part of our fleeting time here, guided by this most human of emotions. I'm sure that makes you want to read the book. (laughs) Certainly got me all the way to the last page without a doubt. Let me spend a few more minutes with um, his defining awe. He's rather done that bit in the preface, of course, but let's just put together a definition, which I think is always important. With emotion, science turning its attention to the varieties of positive emotion in 2003, my longtime collaborator at New York University, Jonathan Haidt, and I worked to articulate a definition of awe. At the time, there were only a few scientific articles on awe, but thousands on fear. There were no definitions of awe to speak of. So we immersed ourselves in the writings of mystics about their encounters with the divine. We read treatments of the holy, the sublime, the supernatural, the sacred, and peak experiences that people might describe with words like flow and joy, bliss, or even enlightenment. We considered political theorists like Max Weber and their speculations about the passions of mobs whipped up by demigods. We read anthropologists' accounts of awe in dance, music, art, and religion in faraway, remote cultures. Drawing upon these veins of scholarship, we defined awe as follows. Awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. Awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. Vastness can be physical, for example, when you stand next to a 350 foot tall tree, or hear a singer's voice or electric guitar fill the space of an arena. Vastness can be temporal, as when a laugh or scent transports you back in time to the sounds of or aromas of your childhood. Vastness can be semantic or about ideas, most notably when an epiphany integrates scattered beliefs and unknowns into a coherent thesis about the world. Vastness can be challenging, unsettling, destabilizing. In evoking awe, it reveals that our current knowledge is not up to the task of making sense of what we have encountered. And so in awe, 
we go in search of new forms of understanding. Awe is about our relation to the vast mysteries of life. What about the innumerable variations in awe? How are changes from one culture to another or from one period in history to another or from one person to another or even one moment in your life to understand? The content of what is vast varies dramatically across cultures and the contexts of our lives. In some places, it is high altitude mountains, and in others, flat, never ending plains with storms approaching. For infants, it is the immense warmth provided by parents. And when we die, the enormous expanse of our lives. During some historical periods, it is the violence humans are capable of, and during other times, protests in the streets against the machines and institutions that perpetrate violence. The varieties of vastness of myriad, giving rise to shifts in the meaning of all, flavoring themes, John and I reasoned, also account for variations in all. By flavoring themes, we meant context-specific ways in which we ascribe meaning to vast mysteries. For example, you shall learn that extraordinary virtue and ability can lead us to feel awe. Conceptions of virtue and ability vary dramatically according to context, whether, for example, we find ourselves in combat or at a meditation retreat, whether we are part of a hip-hop performance or a chess club, whether we live in a region of religious dogma or one governed by the rules of Wall Street. How we conceptualize virtue and ability within our local culture gives rise to variations in awe. My, what a great amount of food for thought I thought this to be. I, Love being awestruck. I think we both, all of us do. Being awestruck, certainly the memory of Istanbul and in 1999 and that feeling of awe, but certainly looking over vast landscapes in the western part of the country or from the top of Mount Washington, for example, in our own part of the country. I, I quite like the book. It's, it's filled with fascinating information that you may have come across in bits and pieces, but never quite put the whole puzzle together. I think it's quite worth reading, and it is the hot book of the season, I've been told. So before all the summer parties begin, it's a good idea to catch up on the best seller du jour. Awe, oh, the new science of everyday wonder, everyday wonder, and how it can transform your life. Let me take a few moments to talk about next week's book. Next week, we're going to a book, new book, uh, published uh, uh, some time ago in 2022, but uh, some time ago, listen to me, it's only months ago, isn't it? Uh, by a main author. The name of the book is Mill Town, Reckoning with What Remains. Maybe you have some experiences there. I certainly do in the town of Old Town, where I grew up and the mill, as it was called. Milltown was the winner of the 2021 Rachel Carson Environmental Book Award. I obviously made an error. It was published in 2021, not in 2022. Winner of the 2021 Main Literary Award for Nonfiction. Finalist for the 2021 National Book Critics John Leonard Prize, Best First Book. Finalist for the 2021 New England Society Book Award. Finalist for the 2021 New England Independent Booksellers Association Award. A New York Times Editor's Choice and Chicago Tribune Top Book of the Year. Book. How great for a first book, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you quickly about the story. Carrie Arsenault grew up in the small rural town of Mexico, Maine where for over 100 years, the community orbited around a paper mill. 
and provided jobs for nearly everyone in town, including three generations of her family. Carrie had a happy childhood, but years after she moved away, she realized the price she paid for that childhood, the price everyone paid, the mill, while providing the social and economic cohesion of the community, also contributed to its demise. Milltown is a book of narrative nonfiction, investigative memoir, and cultural criticism that illuminates the rise and collapse of the working class, the hazards of loving and leaving home, and the ambiguous nature of toxics and disease with the central question, who or what are we willing to sacrifice for our own survival? Robert McFarlane, author of Underland, marvelous book as well, quotes, Milltown is a book of a lifetime, a deep drilling, quick moving, heartbreaking story. Scathing and tender, it lifts often into poetry, but comes down hard when it must. Through it all runs the river, sluggish, ancient, dangerous, frightened with America's sins. It's quite a moving book. Quite a movie book. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And having grown up in a mill town, a shoe mill also, I didn't mention that about Old Town, the shoe mill. Um, and of course, the great big paper mill. And I live in a building here in Camden that was 1850 on a river um, with a mill. So I have mills in my blood, I think. Thank you very much for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed it and were intrigued by it uh, enough to go out and get the book from the library or from your local bookshop. If you did like it, please do press the icon thumbs up there in front of you. <laughs> Maybe even you want to consider sharing it with someone who has recently had an awesome experience. Also, uh, please do leave a comment. Uh, about the author or the book or the reading, or perhaps your favorite book. We come up with four to five books each month. This is our 119th program. <laughs> so we're always looking for books and we'd love it when people tell us what their favorite book is and see if it fits into the month's schedule. So do send us that. Um, one more icon there, you see in front of you a larger one, the subscribe button. You would press that it certainly doesn't cost anything but what it does do is give us a vote of confidence and it puts us in the number one spot still for over six months now uh in the state of maine among all public libraries uh, both small and large with the largest number of subscribers to a a youtube channel uh program so from the library so please do press that we're quite proud of Camden in our mid-sized village to be number one in the state. So I hope you might press that. It doesn't cost anything, just your email address so we can keep you abreast of what's going on. <sighs> Thank you. I'm going to go outside and look for something awesome like shoveling. Thank you again for being with me. I hope you have a, a good and safe week ahead as uh, spring comes and the crocuses uh, go back to coming up in the sunshine, we hope. Take care of yourself, particularly be careful, and above all, be healthy and happy. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>